day. And Father, we just we want we want to rejoice together as we sing and as we think about what you've accomplished um, in Christ for us. And Father, we just pray that you would guide our hearts, direct our thoughts, uh, open us up to receive and to hear from your word today. Lord, that we wouldn't just be hearing the word, but that we would do what the word says. Shape our thoughts. Change our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In, in our lives, we work pretty hard, I think most of us do anyway, to, to establish our standing in the world in which we live. I mean, we try to establish ourselves at work. I think most of us try to establish ourselves as someone who works hard, does the job. Uh, we try to have a good standing with our employer. Uh, we try to uh, establish our credit financially so we can maybe make larger purchases. Um, we try to gain a standing with our group of friends, the people we hang out with. I mean, we think about that and we... We are often trying to establish our reputation and our standings. And today I, I just want to preach about uh, what I just read, the grace in which we stand. Those are Paul's words. And, and they remind us that our standing with God is way more important than what our standing might be with other human beings. The most important thing is where we stand with God. So Paul begins this chapter, chapter 5, but with the word therefore, which points back to those first four chapters where Paul has essentially done one thing. He's helped us to understand that there is a way to be made right with God, but the way is not maybe what we would think. Because most of us think that if we want something, we work for it, and we earn it. But when it comes to the word grace, we come to understand that salvation is only something that God can do and accomplish. So we've learned that we, we stand in need of God's saving grace. and We've learned that, that it's only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, that we are made right with God. But those who have been justified, Paul's making the point that we have a new status. We stand... In God's grace. And some have a view of God's grace where uh, we are in and out of God's grace. This is not the view that Paul gives. Paul says that justification is a definitive legal declaration. It's not subject to our performance or anything else. So today we just want to talk about what it means to stand in this amazing saving, justifying grace of God. If we've been made right with God by His grace through faith, then we have this new status. And one of the things that Paul does here, he doesn't exactly explain what the status is because he, that's really what he's done. He said, if you've trusted in Christ, this is your new status, right with God because of what he did. But what he does do here in these 11 verses is really lays out for us the benefits or the blessings of being made right with God. Because if you have this new status with God, that means, that, that means something in your life, like how you live your life. It's not just some uh, doctrinal statement, you know, justified by grace. It means something every day for the believer. And so he, he says right off the bat, he says that since we've been justified, we have peace. With God. Peace with God. So the first benefit of this justification, this standing of grace, is that we have peace. Uh, we who were once not at peace with God now have peace with God through faith in Christ. We're declared right by God, and this has brought peace. And peace here is not just the absence of conflict. This peace uh, that we have points to this reality of this new status. 
Like it's ongoing, eternal, uh, definitive peace. We have it. We don't hope we have peace. Have peace with God if we're Christ. We stand in grace and under grace. And Paul goes on to say that part of this blessing of peace with God means that we've obtained this access to God. We live with ongoing access to the grace of God. And His grace is always sufficient. And His grace is always enough. And His grace never runs dry. The saving grace which changes us uh, from lost to saved is available each and every day for every trial, for every temptation, for every struggle. Because we're made right with God, we have access. We can call out to God. We can receive from God. We can live for God. And it's all owing to God's grace. And because of this new status, we, we don't live in fear, fear, fear of judgment. You know, like God is, is, is getting ready to throw down on us. No, because if we're in Christ, we have this peace and we can rejoice. We have this hope of glory. This newfound peace uh, points not only to our present access, like today, if we're in Christ, we call out to God and receive grace. But it, it does point to future grace. That there's coming a day, we sing about it, that we believe the resurrection of the dead. That God will bring His people back to life to be with Him forever. We have peace with God. A few years ago, there's a journal called the Personnel Journal. And it's reported this statistic, incredible statistic. Listen, since the beginning of recorded history, the entire world has been at peace 8% of the time. So in terms of years, history's been recorded for relatively close to this, this number, 3,530 years. And out of all those years, about 286 years can be identified as times of relative peace within the earth. And it also reported that over that same amount of time, 8,000 peace treaties were made by different nations among the earth. And of course, they were all broken at one time or another. Friends, there is no lasting peace apart from the gracious activity of God. Sin brings corruption, sin brings conflict, but God's grace brings real lasting peace. And the peace we have with God through Christ means that we have this standing with God as his sons and his daughters and as friends. So if you become a follower of Christ by faith, then you stand in grace. You stand in grace. Peace with God. Unending grace and hope for all eternity. So we have this peace with God. That's the, one of the blessings of our standing in the right status with God. But there's more. Paul, look in verse 3. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Not only do we have this peace with God, but we have uh, what I would call hope-filled joy. Hope-filled joy. He's already mentioned this, right? This, this, this uh, hope in a secure future. This joy in that our standing means no judgment. There's therefore now no condemnation if we're in Christ. So there's this hope of the glory of God. It said earlier in Romans 3, For all have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. Everything that God intended for us in terms of relationship to Him was broken in the fall. And our sin separates us from God. But this future hope, this hope of the glory of God, is that one day and Jesus breaks through the clouds and He brings us to be with Him and and that we are in that perfect relationship with God. 
unhindered by sin. We have this hope in the glory of God. And we no longer have to live in a fear of tomorrow. I can't tell you how many times um, I've met people who live in fear. And a Christian is not to live in fear. Jesus said, don't, don't worry. He basically says, look, I got this thing covered. D- don't worry about it. I mean, you got all these things that, in your life that, you know, these needs and desires and, you know, it's, don't worry. So we have to live in fear of tomorrow. We have, when I grew up, the fear was the Soviets coming and starting World War III. You know, so I remember that kind of always afraid of world war. And for some people, that's, that's scary. I mean, as soon as they see the image on the screen of something happening in the Middle East or some other country, then they start to, they, they just feel this, you know, they feel unhinged. Of course, Hollywood's made a, a bunch of money playing on the fear of people thinking about the end of the world, Right? Some people feel like, is this the end, you know? I read the other day that the, this happens all the time, by the way. Asteroid, you know, coming to, towards the earth. It's like 30 million miles away. But they still tell you that, you know. And then they say, well, and if it does hit the earth, which it won't, <laughs> it could really cause a problem. And then it tells you about all the other ones that are going to fly by the earth. Well, you know, you read that and you think, well, hmm, oh, what could happen the end of the world. But we, we don't have to be afraid of that. We, hey, listen, God tells us what's going to happen in his word. We don't know every detail about how that's going to play out, but here's the deal. We know the, the basic outline, right? Jesus comes back and sets everything right. And if we're in Christ, we're with him forever. That's just the most basic line of hope that we have. No fear. No fear. But hope. Hope in a secure future. We have this, it's a hope-filled joy. We can have joy in present tri- in trials, present trials that lead to hope. He, he, said, he said that we were to rejoice in suffering. That we can rejoice in our sufferings. Now, I don't think Paul, what Paul is not saying here, okay? He's not saying enjoy your sufferings. I mean, if your back is hurting, he's not saying, oh, this is so fun. This is great. I love this. You know, you got a cold or the flu or pneumonia. I mean, he's not saying, you know, just, you know, this is the greatest thing ever. I do this every day of the week. Now, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, is that we can rejoice in our sufferings. He's saying our sufferings have a purpose. There's a purpose in the things that we go through in our Life And the end goal, by the way, is not hopelessness. It's not despair. If you follow his, his train of thought here, he goes, he goes from suffering to endurance to character. All these leading towards what? Hope. Hope. Whatever it is that we go through in this life, God intends to use it to secure our hope. In Him, not in, the, not in the sufferings, not in this world, but in Him. That we can have joy that leads to hope. The end goal is always hope. And we're not talking about human hope. We're not talking about human hope, a pipe dream, or anything like that. The hope here is what it says in, in the text, does not put us to shame. It means that this hope that we have, we're not going to be disappointed. We won't be disappointed by God. This hope that we have, it's for real. It's a hope that comes from God and from receiving God's love in Christ. The Holy Spirit, His work pouring out God's love on us. He's the active agent in our salvation. He gives us this hope. He gives us a hope that does not fade. I wonder today, as you're here, and you think about your life, both the span of your life and years, and the nearness of this season of your life that you're in. And I wonder, do you have this hope-filled joy? 
Now, you, you, you might say, well, Brother Andy, I've been going through a lot of rough stuff, and I don't, I don't know if, if I feel really. I'm, I'm really not talking about how you feel. I'm talking about your spiritual understanding of, of life and what, who God is. And that no matter what you go through in life, nothing, nothing, Paul says in Romans 8, we'll get there eventually, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. That's hope. No matter what the circumstances are, that's hope. If you stand in God's grace, then you can know this enduring hope, this joy of God. That brings us to the last blessing. The last blessing, which is love. Which is love. He, he mentions that there, and I didn't, I didn't finish reading the verse, but he says in verse 5 that this hope comes because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so we're talking about love. Paul switches over to love, but it's, it's a very specific kind of love. It's certainly God's love. But, but the word I'm going to use here is a word he uses in the text, but that we have a reconciling love, a reconciling love. Our hope-filled joy comes from the overflow of God's love poured out on us through the Holy Spirit. So when you find God's love, if you're to do a word study, you find the idea of God's love, um, you will find that when it's spoken of in the New Testament, that the death of Christ is always associated with it. Now, if you mention God's love in almost any context, you get all kinds of different views on God's love. People often speak of God's love, but rarely do they understand it. Because to understand God's love, you must understand the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul points to the greatness and the magnitude of God's love for us in Christ. And what he's really showing us here is that God's love is not like man's love, the kind of love that we know and experience. God's love is a different kind of love altogether. God's love, it's revealed in contrast to our standing before God. And so look what he says in verse 6. He says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. So when, when Paul starts to say in his mind, he's saying, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking I'm going to write about God's love to the Romans. And I want them to understand what this love looks like. And so where, where does he start? He says, For we were weak and ungodly, and God still loved us. He's thinking, well, that's got to have something to do with, with what God's, God's, God's love is. That we, and this is what he means by saying we're weak and ungodly. He's saying we were hopeless. We were hopeless. And yet, and yet, Christ died for us. If we want to understand God's love, we must go to the cross and understand what Jesus did. God's love is also revealed to us, according to Paul, in contrast to human love. So in verse 7 it says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person, one would dare even to die. So Paul is, is thinking, you know, I mean, most of us, if, if, if we thought that our spouse was in danger or our child was in danger or a friend or someone we knew that was a good person and we had to lay our life down on the line for them, he said, we, we might do that. But he said, that's not what Jesus did. He said, understand this, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't lay his life down on the line for a spouse, a friend, a son, a daughter, or a good person. He just said, reminded the Romans in chapter 3, there is none righteous. No, not one. No, the magnificent thing about, about God's love is that when Jesus died for us, he died for those who were opposed 
to him. Verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How did he demonstrate his love? Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. This, I mean, this is the, the gospel. This is the good news. The good news is not we're lost and separated in our sins. That's bad news. That is, that is a hopeless condition. That is weak, a weak condition. That is an ungodly position. But the, the glory of the gospel is that Jesus died in spite of that, Be, because of that. And that in him dying on the cross, he showed the extent of his love. He went all the way to death. The Son of God, who was not weak, who was not ungodly or unrighteous in, in any way. The perfect Lamb of God, slain for us on the cross. And to be made right with God, to be saved, to experience these blessings, is to receive Christ, to call out to Christ. I hope you are blessed to hear Justin's testimony today. I was reading a devotion uh, not too long ago about how we need to be careful about looking at people and only freezing one period of time in their life or one event in their life. I don't know about you, but there's some times in my life that if that was like the measure of my life, that one event frozen in time, uh, that would be the end of me. I mean, there would be no hope. You won't talk about hopeless, utterly hopeless, but understand something that because of the power of Christ, God can take we who wicked sinners do all manner of evil things and God can transform our lives and make a new person. Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. The new has come. And that's all because of what Jesus did on the cross. If you're here today and you don't, don't know Christ, or maybe you're like, I just don't, you know, you talk about standing in grace. I don't know if I stand in grace or not. Let me tell you today. If you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, call out to him. You too can stand in grace and know his peace and know this joy and hope and this love of God. The Paul goes further, though, to show that God's love didn't just make this declaration, you know, that we believe and then, and then he says, you're right now with God. You have the right standing. It, it's not just that. It, it is just that, but it's not just that. Let me show you what, I, what I'm saying here. It says in verse 9, Since therefore we now have been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Verse 10, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So what is Paul getting at? Well, he's saying we haven't simply just been made right with God by His declaration. God has literally bridged the great gap, the great divide, the separation that our sin has caused. So he uses this word reconcile. And reconcile is not a legal word. Uh, justify is to acquit somebody and to say, you are right. You're in right standing. That's, but reconcile is relational. Reconciliation happens when you have two parties that are hostile against one another. And now there's that peace. <laughs> Hope, joy, love. This is reconciling love. And by the way, he's not just simply saying that we were enemies in the sense of we're enemies of God. Uh, there was enmity between God and man. Right? Jesus said that if we are not in him, then we are under wrath. 
We're under wrath. That's why Paul is going to great pains to say, look, if we've been made right with God, uh, this means that no more wrath, no more fear, no more condemnation. This has been dealt with by Jesus on the cross. So standing in God's grace means that we are reconciled. And that we have the hope of completed salvation, by the way. So when we talk about being saved, which he mentions here, we can talk about it this way. We can talk about that we, uh, we are saved, which is present. We can talk about we were saved, which is past. And we can talk about we are being saved, which is future. And Paul has all of these things in mind. That God, in reconciling us to himself, he has done, is doing, and will do all the above. So standing in grace means we've received this reconciliation. So now we're called sons and daughters of God. We're called the friend of God. If we're in grace. In no other religion do we find this type of reconciling love. Our great God is a God who He comes to us, He indwells us, and makes a way for us to have a personal relationship with Him, a love relationship with Him. The God of Islam is a distant and fickle God. The Greek gods... Like Zeus. They were warmongers. Abusers of humanity. The Hindu gods offer no relationship but a state of nirvana. As you study all the other major religions of the world, you will find a god or gods who offer no real hope, no real joy, and no real answers. But the God of the Bible, he brings humanity close to him. He speaks to us. He comes to us. He offers justification made right with God. He offers reconciliation and love. And Jesus gives abundant life, eternal life with God. I wonder today, have you received this kind of love we all have in our own mind what love should look like what it's supposed to look like and how we're supposed to give it and receive it but according to Paul real love true love is the love of God in Christ for us it brings enemies together and creates friends So if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, then we are declared right before God. But this right standing in God's grace, as we've said, it's so much more than a legal reality. It's a standing with benefits that provides peace, hope-filled joy, reconciling love, and this confident hope that we have that God is doing this great work of salvation. So this gives the Christian great cause for joy. Now, in the Old Testament... There's a story about the Israelites, and they had been captives for a long time, and they had rebuilt the city, the temple, and the the walls, and there was a time when they found the Word of God. It had been hidden away, and the Word of God was brought before the people and read. And this represented a real sense of restoration. Like, like, like we messed up, God like sent us away, and then God brought us back. And this is a real reminder of restoration. But when they heard the words, they began to weep and they began to grieve. Why? Because they realized, first of all, they didn't deserve the reconciliation. They didn't deserve the restoration. And if anything, they felt the guilt and the shame of the fact that they had failed to follow the word of God. And yet we're told in that text, found in Nehemiah, don't weep, don't grieve. It says, for the joy of the Lord will be your 
strength. Now, I don't know if you picked up on this last verse, but I want, I want you to see something here in it. Verse 11 says, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I believe the average Christian does not live in the joy of the Lord like we should. And I believe one of the reasons why that is true is because we do not fully understand. We are not grasping the blessings we have received from God. The greatest blessings we have from God are not, watch this, it's not our family, our work, our friends, our stuff, our health, the greatest blessings we receive from God flow from the gospel itself. And if we have a deficiency in joy, it's because we are not fully grasping and holding on to the blessings that God has given to us in Christ Paul says that we are reconciled to God so that we can rejoice in Him. So when we talk about salvation and we see life transformation, like in Justin, I keep picking on Justin because he got baptized today. But many of us have experienced the same thing. But when we hear that transformation, we're thinking, man, God, you are awesome. How did you do that? Like, how did you do that? Right? That's what Paul's saying. That's what our, our, our reaction should be when we hear these things. What? Peace with God? God, how did you do that? You know? And then like, like hope-filled joy, like that we go, wow, I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid anymore. And like, wow, God, how did you do that? <laughs> you know? And, then, and you're like, oh, I can call out to God at any time. Oh, I can study God's word. I can receive from God at any time. Wow, God, how did you do that? And he said, because I'm God and I can do that. Our great God. Oh, our great God. What a magnificent, awesome God. That he would give us peace and hope and joy and love. So through faith and by grace we come to understand we are not just some pawns in some divine distant plan. But that we are objects of God's love. And that we are known by God and we can know God. And friends, if that doesn't give us joy, we're not getting it. We're not understanding it. We desperately need to understand the grace of God. The amazing, saving, justifying, joyful, giving grace of God. So today two things. Say, what, what, what do we do with all this? Well, I hope you process it. I hope that God works it in. You think about this. But what do we do? What do we do now? First question, are you standing in grace? Are you standing in grace? Or is there some question? Have you received the grace of God? Have you come to faith? And if you haven't, we're going to have a time of response, and I would invite you, then or even now, to call out to the Lord and receive grace. Second thing, Christian, are you enjoying the benefits of your grace standing with God? Like, are you actually living in such a way that you are reminding yourself daily of the blessings you have received in Christ? You say, well, what exactly? You mean, you mean I need to sit around and read this and kind of say it out loud or what well no actually you think about it there's very practical ways that you do this right if we have access to God through this grace then wouldn't we be uh 
consistently calling out to God in prayer, right? I mean, if we're living in these blessings, are we praying? Are, are we listening to God? If we have this access, this grace, are we listening to God? Are we countering fear? What I'm not saying is, I'm not saying that we don't ever get afraid. I'm not saying that we don't uh, ever uh, feel insecure. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that we have a gospel answer for those things. And so the question is, what do you do when you get afraid? What do you do when you start to worry? Do you recognize I am standing in grace. I don't have to be afraid. I, know I am not insecure in my future. I, my future is secure. I have hope. I have peace. When Satan, he comes to you and says, you dirty, rotten scoundrel, I know your past. I know what you did. Let me show you how bad you were and how bad you are. Are you able to say, no, 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 no. I have peace with God. Through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's what I'm I'm asking. Are you enjoying the benefits of your grace standing with God? And do you have joy? Do you have joy? Do you have joy? Sometimes, you know, I think one of the reasons why we struggle with doing evangelism is because we don't really look at happy. We don't really look like we got joy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, listen, folks, we ought to go out of here today with joy. Seriously. Like, you ought to, if you go to a restaurant or if you go eat food with family, you ought to have joy. And say, what are you so happy about? I got grace. God's grace. I'm standing in grace. Why are you so happy? I'm standing in grace. There's something attractive that God uses when we have joy-filled Christians. And that's a simple thing. Are you living in the joy of the Lord? I don't know about you, but I'm glad. I am glad. I am filled with joy that I stand by God's grace, in God's grace, through Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me today? Father, we come to you.